If you need a Bible, today raise your hand. We're in Nehemiah chapter 5. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible. I uh, just want to follow up uh, on a couple of announcements. I want to encourage you guys, if you have high schoolers and uh, they need a break from you this summer, <laughs> then stop by. Stop by. I think the meeting is in the senior high room. and uh, So you can go to the senior high room, get some more information. Uh, La Gloria is where our training center's at. Your kids are going to have a great time. God's going to bless them. We've been talking to you guys about plugging in and volunteering. Anybody else need a Bible? Raise your hand. I uh, want to encourage you guys as you're walking out today uh, and you're heading that way, there's a table that's set up and Marisa, is, uh, Marisa Lang is ready to um, talk to you about serving and um, happy to help you plug in and maybe you're in the process of discovering your spiritual gifts. You know, I, I know a lot of people are like just waiting to be asked, uh, so I'm asking you right now, would you consider serving? Would you, would you stop by the table and um, get some information? God wants to use you and he wants you to discover your spiritual gifts. Happy July 4th weekend. Uh, you know I, know, I know it's kind of a conundrum because uh, July 4th is Wednesday. So this is how hard it is to be an American. Like, do you celebrate it this weekend or do you celebrate it next weekend? Um, you poor people, <laughs> dif difficult things you have to deal with. Um, I will say this, thank God for the United States of America. <clears throat> Uh, I'm, I am a, I'm a proud patriot, and uh, I don't think that patriotism is a four-letter word. I think our country is uh, a gift from God. Uh, we are certainly not perfect. We have a lot to work on. Jesus is the answer to every single issue that we have, and we're praying. You know, we're praying for, we're praying for another great awakening. You know, um, certainly we see that uh, God is wrapping things up, and and we need to see God do a work in our nation. So we're going to read the scripture today, and uh, we're going to pray for our country. Would you stand this morning with me, Nehemiah, chapter 5. If you guys remember the story, uh, things have been uh, awesome, just amazing. God's done an incredible work, and, uh, and yet, you know, we kind of have a drama chapter here. There, there had to be a drama chapter somewhere, so here it is, chapter 5, verse 1 says this. And there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brethren. For there were those who said, we are sons and our daughters are many, therefore let us get grain that we may eat and live. That's a reasonable request. There were also some who said, we've mortgaged our lands and vineyards and houses that we might buy grain because of the famine. There were also, it gets worse, there were also those who said, we've borrowed money for the king's tax on our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and indeed we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been brought into slavery. It is not in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and vineyards. And now Nehemiah is speaking. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, you may want to circle that, I rebuked the nobles and, el and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we've been we have redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren or should they be sold to us? Then they were silenced and found nothing to say. Th he's not done. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies, I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury or charging uh, interest. Verse 11, restore now to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their olive groves, and their houses, also a hundredth of the money and the grain, the new wine and the oil that you've charged them. So they said, we will restore it and will require nothing from them. We will do as you say. 
Then I called the priests and required an oath from them that they would do according to this promise. Then I shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out each man from his house and from his property. Who does not perform this promise? Even thus may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. Then the people did according to this promise. Father, we pray today, God, honored and privileged to be able to, to seek your face, God, to talk to you today together as your people. And, and Father, we, we just ask, be merciful to our country. We're so thankful for every freedom. We're thankful, God, for the gifts that you give us, for the, the liberty to pursue the lives um, that you have for us. And God, we ask for one more great awakening. We pray for one more great spiritual stirring and Father, if the nation needs to be shaken to awaken it to its need for you, God, we pray, as hard as it may be, shake us up, stir us. God, cause the spiritual lethargy to fall like scales from our eyes and do a work that would once again glorify you, Father. We want you glorified in this nation. And we pray, God, you be glorified in this church. Bind our hearts together with bands of love. And may we be marked by unity. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat today. Some things are meant to divide. Cells divide. Stocks divide. Continents divide. Christian relationships are not meant to divide. Jesus said it like this. He said, a kingdom divided, you guys know how this goes? A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Uh, we know that that's true. It's true for countries. Abraham Lincoln invoked that during uh, the conflagration of the Civil War that had the potential of ripping the country apart. And while he knew there were issues that needed to be resolved, at the end of the day, um, he understood the importance of unity. But look, it's true. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Friendships divided against themselves. Families divided against themselves. Marriages divided against themselves. Ministries divided against themselves. And churches, and churches divided against themselves cannot stand. God understands, and I hope that we do too, the importance of unity in fulfilling his purpose. Somebody once said this, and I think it's true, God is good at math, he adds, he sub subtracts, he multiplies, but God does not divide. Uh, the heart of God is never division in Christian relationships. Now, like we've been rolling through the book of Nehemiah, it's been awesome, it's been amazing to see what God has done just so faithful, faithfully on behalf of his people, miracle after miracle, as they were taking steps of faith and um, God was vanquishing the enemies from the outside. There were victories that were granted. Uh, the people were, were restored uh, in their work for God and their worship of God. They had a trowel in one hand. They had a sword in the other. And God was doing mighty things. Um, but you know, like if you've done life long enough, it's almost like you're waiting for the shoe to drop. You, you know that it just can't go that smoothly. There has to be drama somewhere because it just seems there's always drama in our lives. Is, is there not? Wouldn't you love a reprieve for drama? Raise your hand if that's you today. Okay, it's coming in heaven. You got a while to wait, but it's coming in heaven. And, you know, it's all, if you haven't read the book, like you're waiting. You're waiting for the moment of drama. Well, Nehemiah chapter 5 is a moment of drama. After all they've been through, you know, think about this, okay? After all they've been through, after all God has done, now this great work of God is, is at risk because of conflict on the inside. And this is the story. Um, the people were struggling. They were suffering. There was a famine that, you know, had come upon the land. And, and they just had this simple request, hey, our families need to eat. Um, but the problem was this, they didn't have the resources for it. And so there were a certain group of Jewish people who were charging um, at great interest the people to purchase food. So the people in need were borrowing money at great interest. The, they, were, they were mortgaging their land just to pay the king's taxes. They were so totally leveraged, some of them had to sell their sons and daughters into slavery 
Um, and they had lost maybe one of the most important possessions, their own land. Remember, if you're Jewish, the land was the inheritance. It was um, dedicated in purpose, not just for you, but for generations to come. So look, in a moment where the people should have been looking after each other, in this difficult situation, after all God had done as, as he had come through over and over again, in this moment when they should have been taking care of each other, instead what they were doing was they were taking advantage of each other. And the people had lost sight of the fact that they were family. Instead of considering each other faithfully and lovingly, they had lost sight of the fact that they were in this battle together, that there, were, there was a, a purpose that God had that really should have united them. Some of the people lost sight of that. And because of their actions, there was conflict and schism and division. And Nehemiah's response is this. Nehemiah's like, what? That's, that's what the original Hebrew says, like with the pause like that. What? He's like, really? You know, he's, he's incensed. There's righteous indignation. I mean, the guy's laid down his life. He's led the people. God has done a work. And this is what he's thinking. He's thinking, are you serious? After all God has done, the work of God is now going to be at risk because of this absurdity. Now, thankfully, thankfully, he pauses and he thinks it through. But he fully understands this spiritual axiom. And I think... I think it's true. If you're a student of church history, you know that most great works of God fall not because of outside pressure, but because of inside conflict. You know, in fact, if you are a student of church history, you understand that when the pressure is greater on the outside, the church doesn't break, the church doesn't crumble, the church multiplies. This is why the early church fathers said that Blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Like the Roman Empire thought, man, we'll just slaughter these guys. The problem was the more they slaughtered, the more the church multiplied. And now the devil understands, look, if, if, I, can't, if I can't bring it down from the outside, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to bring it down from the inside. We're not un unaware of the wiles or the methods or the strategies of Satan. And like any good strategist, strategist, he understands that if he can effectively divide from the inside, then the work of God will be at risk. Nehemiah gave this serious thought. Instead of just reacting in uh, anger and overcome by emotion, he steals some time away and he prays and he thinks this through. Because listen, as a good leader, what he wants is he wants to achieve unity. The, the people are about to go off the rails, and so what he is seeking to do is pull them back so that they're back on track and they're fulfilling God's purpose. And there are four things, if you're taking notes today, there are four things that he implements um, as the great leader that he was. I call them Nehemiah's four today, so if you're taking notes, Nehemiah's four uh, and I want to remind you guys, like he was a, a solid leader. I think one of my favorite leaders in uh, the Bible is Nehemiah. He understood that unity is worth fighting for. Do you guys believe that today? Do you believe unity is worth fighting for? Like he knew it had to be addressed. You couldn't just sweep it under the carpet because uh, division is like cancer. If it goes unaddressed, ultimately it brings death. If the devil can't, fly, can't find compliant agents on the outside... He will find compliant agents on the inside. And sometimes unwittingly, we as Christians, if we're not careful, we become tools of the enemy that bring division to the body of Christ. Paul uh, took this very seriously. He took the issue of division very seriously. And he said to Titus, uh, by the way, if you don't know, Titus was the lead pastor over all of the churches on the island of Crete. And as he's instructing Titus on the importance of unity and the danger of division, he says this, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Let me just say it again. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. So he says, hey, listen, Titus, you're responsible like you're leading the people and you have to understand that when there's somebody in the midst 
whether they call themselves a Christian or whether they don't. Someone in the midst who's bringing division, bringing schism, causing conflict in the church for whatever reason, you can't just ignore it. You've got to address it. And when you address it, if they're not responsive after the first admonition or the first correction, uh, and even after the second one, then this is what you do. You reject that person. You resist that person. You put that person on the outside because you understand at the end of the day what's going on in their heart is sin. They're warped and sinning and they're self-condemned. Now, I've been a Christian for a little over 25 years. I can't believe it's been so long. And I can tell you, uh, that as a believer and as a pastor, that oftentimes division in the church is not over issues of orthodoxy. You know, there are things, like when a church is operating unbiblically, when it's denying the truth of God's word, there are things we absolutely, without a doubt, draw a line in the sand on, and we stand our ground. But I can tell you, the 95 at least percent of the time, division in churches or in Christian relationships is over inconsequential, meaningless things. And I think, look, if you're married, you understand that. If you really just step back and evaluated all of the conflict that you've had in your marriage, for the most part, the majority of it is over stuff that doesn't even matter. <laughs> can I be honest with you guys today? Can I be raw? Can, can, I, just, can I be real about, about Christians? Christians are so hypersensitive. And, and as I say that today, if you just got offended by that, <laughs> like really, really, sometimes, sometimes the drama, it's, it's even, is it just embarrassing? As Christians, sometimes the stuff that we fight over, the conflicts that we're in, you know, I've, I just was thinking this through this week about some of the different experiences of division that I've seen and some of the absurd stuff that I've seen Christians divide over. And I thought I'd make a little list to share with you guys today. Can I, can I do that? Can I, can I, can I, can I? I've seen, I've seen God, God's people divide over the color of paint on a building. I've seen God's people divide over the length of heels that women can wear. I've seen God's people divide over the placement of people for prayer after the service. I've seen God's people divide over Bible translations that other Christians read. I've seen God's people divide over the order of service and the location of donuts. I've seen God's people divide over the length of the worship leader's hair. Now, and I'm just, I just would like to say, I'm just praying for some hair, right? I mean, please. Just give me, just give me some of that. I've seen, this is not an exaggeration, I've seen churches taken down, people divide over, other people getting larger portions served to them at church functions. There was one in instance where a deacon got a larger slice of ham than the other deacons, and because his slice was bigger, uh, this is no exaggeration, the church not only divided, it split, and it, it, it closed its doors. And look, I think, yeah, what? That's, that's, what, uh, that's what Nehemiah said. Look, and I think really the absurdity, the absurdity of the stuff. I know I don't want to be that guy. And I know that you don't want to be that person. And that we want to have a church. This is the local church that you are called to be a part of. And I'm saying to you today that unity in the church and unity in your relationships, husband, wives, mom, dad, sons, daughters, Christian relationships, unity is worth fighting for and unity honors God. So, so look, how do you get there? How do you get there? What did Nehemiah do? Like he got it, you know? I, the very work of God was just about to go off the rails and the whole thing could have been... Uh, 
could have come tumbling down, but this was what he did. As a good leader, he stepped in. And there are four things. So let me just reread, beginning in verse six. And I became very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. After serious thought, I rebuked the nobles and rulers and said to them, each of you is exacting usury from his brother. So I called a great assembly against them. And I said to them, according to our ability, we've redeemed our Jewish brethren who were sold to the nations. Now indeed, will you even sell your brethren? Or should they be sold to us? Like he's like, really, you guys? Are you kidding me? After all God has done, and now he has redeemed us, and now you're gonna put us by your foolish behavior back into the same situation? And this is what it says. Then they were silenced, and they found nothing to say because they were wrong. I added that part, but that's what it means. <laughs> because they were wrong. Then I said, what you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? So look, let's be people who fight for unity. Number one, we can, we can be that, we can achieve that if, if we prioritize God's opinion. If we prioritize God's opinion, if we are people who live with God's opinion first in our mind. I think, look, I think these people probably felt justified. I think, like, if you sat down with them and said, hey, what's, what's the deal with the interest and the mortgages and all of that? They probably had all of this reasoning laid out based upon their own opinion. The problem was this. They failed to consult God's opinion. They failed to get God's perspective on the, on the matter. And Nehemiah says, look, you, what you're doing is not good. You need to walk in the fear of the Lord. You need to walk in the fear of God. You have forgotten that God cares about every single detail in your life. That God cares about what you think and what you say and how you act and how you treat people. You have failed to prioritize God's perspective. Look, you have lost sight of what matters most. You know, as justified as you may feel in any given situation, as justified as you may feel, you and I are never justified to divide. There's never a time where God has given us a license to bring division, to be a source of division in Christian relationships, um, in family, um, or, or even in the church, even if you're right, even if you're right. You know, you can be right about something and you can handle it the wrong way and guess what? At the end, in the end, at the end of the day, you're wrong. What matters most is not having the upper hand. What matters most is not being right in the situation. What matters most is doing things in a way that honors the Lord. Look, if you're in that spot, there's two really good uh, questions to present before God in prayer. Number one is this, like if you're in that spot and you have an opinion on something and you feel justified in it, follow the example of Nehemiah, step back and spend some time in, in prayer and ask, ask the Lord, God, what does your word say about this? I don't wanna just have an opinion, I wanna know because I know I'm a fallible human being and you know there's been a couple times in my life where I've been wrong, so God, you know, what does your word say? I wanna get your perspective on the matter. And not only, God, do I want to know what your word says about this issue, God, I wanna handle this in a way that glorifies you. You know how much drama we would save ourselves in this life if we would spend time with God and work through the process of discovering how to glorify him in the difficult relationship issues in our life. God, when it's all said and done, how can I navigate this? How can I be careful about what I say, what to speak, what not to speak, when to engage, when not to engage, because really what I'm after is not just to be right, not just like I said, to have the upper hand, but God, I want you magnified, I want you glorified, I want your power, your majesty, your qualities, your characteristics demonstrated in this difficult situation. You know, in that moment, this is what happens. You ask God for a miracle. Did you know that God wants to do a miracle in your relationship difficulties? Did you know that? Did you know? Did you know you can ask God? Some of you are like. Some of you need to be clapping right now. Some of you need to be clapping. 
Some of you maybe have never experienced it. I'm telling you, you know, it's so important for us to recognize that in the difficulty, you can actually say to God, God, I need your help. God, I can't do this. God, I've blown it so many times. Everything that I do seems to cause dysfunction. So will you step in and will you help me in this? And you know God will be faithful too. The second thing I would suggest that you, that you pray and ask God is this. Does this even matter in the light of eternity? God, okay, help me to see. I don't want to be all, all stirred up, all angry, all torqued. Um, that comes from the Hebrew word torqueo. It means to, okay, no, it doesn't. But I don't want to be all torqued over something that's inconsequential. God, help me to, help me. And this is what pastors do. Focus. Everybody, you know, like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to focus on what matters most. The kingdom of God matters most. The glory of God matters most. The purpose of God matters most. Uh, the, the lost being saved matters most. So you know when you go through the process, this is what God does. He weeds out the stuff that just doesn't matter. God's opinion first. The second thing is this. We have to consider what's at stake. Notice what he says. Should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies? The second thing, look, think about the gravity of it. Nehemiah is saying, hey, you guys, have, you've lost sight of something. All of the enemies of God are looking for an opportunity to reproach him. They're looking for an opportunity um, to criticize, to undermine, to blaspheme, and he says, the way that you've handled these interpersonal relationships is giving God's enemy, enemies an opportunity not just to reproach you. This isn't just about your reputation. This is about God's reputation. People, unbelieving people around us are looking at our lives and they are coming to conclusions about God by the way that we treat each other. You know, what's at stake? When Christians divide, there's a lot of things at stake, but one thing that is at stake is God's reputation. The unbelievers are looking for a justification to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, when they see schism and dysfunction and division, uh, when they see us mistreating each other, you know they feel justified in saying no to Jesus Christ. Now, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that when they stand before God and they say, hey, well, you know, I would have believed, but your, your church was just so jacked up, you know, guaranteed someone's going to say it. But, but even though they say it, they're, they're going to be responsible for their own decision to resist the gospel. But I'm just saying, I don't want to be that guy. And I don't think you want to be that person either that gives some unbelieving individual justification to say no to Jesus Christ. You know, I was talking with... Uh, uh, a gal after the service a couple of months ago, and she had, she, you know, she posts stuff. This is what she was telling me the story. She posts stuff that's benign, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. And she says, you know, I've been posting this stuff. It's just my opinion on things, and I've gotten so much blowback from Christians. Like, I've got all of these Christians that are attacking me on social media. And, you know, I'm like, I get that. I, I know how that feels. What, what I love about Nehemiah is this. Instead of responding in anger, what he does is he steps back. He gives himself an opportunity to settle down a little bit. He prays and he thinks the situation through. Some of you guys need that step in your life. Thank God for verse 7. After serious thought, some of us were like little volcanoes. You know, and it's just, it's the next small thing that's going to trigger us, and we're just going to blow up. It's like all of this stuff is bubbling underneath the surface. And if that's you, more than anyone, you need to step back, and you need to seek the face of God so that you don't make matters worse. I don't think social media helps in this, in this scenario. I'm not anti-social media, but you know it is just so easy for people, you know, to respond in the flesh, to respond emotionally, to pull the phone up, bing, you know. It's, by the way, it's the coward's way of dealing with issues. It just is. If you feel justified in, you know, attacking somebody, 
um, going after somebody and giving your opinion, then, you know, I'm just, I'm just saying, you're taking the coward's way out. The, the mature way of dealing with it is to go to a person personally. You know, this individual that um, was being torn up on, on social media, this is what I think. I think that the non-Christian who is watching the thread is going, are you kidding me, really? Are you kidding me? Why would I want what you guys say you have when really you're no different than the rest of us? That's a problem. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Is this too harsh? He said this. He said, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? You know, I think, I think in our self-righteous, religious Christian circles, we're like, carnal Christian, you know, that, that's a person who struggles with sexual immorality or the person who hasn't kicked smoking cigarettes. Well, what the Bible says is the carnal Christian is the divisive person. It's the hyper-opinionated person. It's the person who's looking to gather to themselves a group of people who follow them and think the way that they, they think while all the while dividing the body of Christ. And, and Paul says, when you roll like that, you are living like you're not even transformed or born again. That's carnality. So we need to remember what's at stake, and what's at stake is the reputation of God. The third thing is this, verse 10. I also, with my brethren and my servants, am lending them money and grain. Please let us stop this usury or um, this charging of interest. The third thing is this. I just want to encourage all of us. Look, be a trendsetter. Be a trendsetter. Be a leader when it comes to fighting for unity. Nehemiah was a man who set a godly example. He says this. Look, you guys. Uh, this is what we're doing. We're helping our brothers and sisters. We're lending money. And at the end of the day, it's probably going to cost us but that doesn't really matter because we're walking in the fear of the Lord. I want to encourage you today, be that person who sets an example for unity. Be that person who's a trendsetter. And when I say unity, I'm not saying uniformity. I'm not saying that we all think the same way or dress the same way. Um, certainly, it doesn't mean that you're a yes person, that you're just compliant in every situation and you don't have an opinion. Uh, that's, that's absolutely not the case. Thank God for our differences. Thank God for the diversity in the body of Christ. Like, look around, look around right now. Would you all really, uh, if it wasn't for Jesus, would you all really be hanging out together? I don't think so. I don't think so. We're, we're a super diverse body of believers, and I think our differences are beautiful. They're, they're part of the miracle that God can take this socially, educationally, um, preferentially, all of the differences that we have, that God can take this and make us one, one spirit, one Lord, one body, one radical miracle of the living God. Thank God for our differences. If you're married today, thank God for the differences that you have with your husband or wife. Right now, I want you to turn and look at your spouse and say, I appreciate our differences. Say that right now. Now repent for lying. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing when he gave her to you. God knew what he was doing when he gave him to you. Right? Help mate. Complete. Like, thank God you're not both the same. My wife completes me in so many different ways. Em embrace the differences. Embrace them. I think it's hard for us, for those of us who are hyper-opinionated to do that. We have any opinionated people here today? I'm really, really, I'm, I am, I can say this to you today, I am the most opinionated person right now in this room, I am. And, no, I am. You have no idea how long it has taken me to realize it. I'm like, wow, I'm really opinionated, huh? We've been uh, married for 22 years this last June 23rd, and, and you know, uh, my wife's put up with a very opinionated person. She's like, hey, babe, where do you want to go to dinner? Honey, I really don't have an opinion uh, on the matter. I go to dinner all the time. 
you pick this time. She's like, well, okay, I really feel like it. I'm like, uh. <laughs> She's like, really? Just tell me where you want to go because I know you have an opinion. Look, there, there are things that in our lives that are just opinions. And sometimes we need to let those things go. There, there would be so much more peace in our lives if we just release the stuff that's inconsequential, that at the end of the day doesn't even matter. You know, as leaders, I want to encourage you to be open to other people's opinions. I can tell you in this church that when we collaborate together, when we're working on something together, and as a team, people are inputting, people are sharing their opinions, uh, when it's all said and done, whatever is done through collaboration is better than if it was done as a dictatorship. Now, I think that that's true for the church. I think that's true in business. I think that's true in the family. Not to be the person that's like, okay, well, you know, I'll let people share their opinion, but really, I know I'm just gonna do what I want anyway. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone that's really, that's really open and understands that God brings beauty in the diversity. Let your life be an example of how to navigate differences while maintaining unity. The final thing is, is this today. Getting it right is the goal. The, the scripture says in verse 11, check it out. Verse 11, restore, what's the next word? Now. Restore now to them. And then down in verse 13 at the very end, he says this, and all the assemblies said amen and praise the Lord then the people did according to this promise. So the, the fourth thing, right? Okay, God's opinion first. Consider what's at stake. It's the reputation of God. Be a leader. Be a leader and get it right. The goal is to get it right. Um, and this is what Nehemiah does. He's, he, he lays this whole thing out. And then the fourth thing is this. Restore. Hey, fix the problem. Fix the problem, and don't fix the problem later. He says, fix the problem now. He knows human nature, and he's not gonna give them an opportunity to kick the can down the road. He knows if he says to them, hey, you know what, you guys, when it's convenient, when you get around to it, when it feels good, when it's the appropriate mo a moment, and you can leverage as much as you can for yourself out of it, he knows better. Because he knows human nature and he knows that's exactly what we do. We avoid it at all cost. And he says, you can't avoid this. You need to address it now. And not only, not only are you going to restore, but I'm calling in the priest because I want you guys to take an oath. Because I know how you are. Make the promise. Dedicate yourself to accomplishing this. And I would say the same thing to us today. If there are relationship issues, if there are divisions and schisms, those things need to be resolved now. And Jesus said it, where, when you're at the altar and you're about to offer your gift and it comes to your mind that there's conflict between you and a brother, this is what you do. You leave the gift, you go and be reconciled, you address the issue now because it's, it's messing up your worship it's messing up your worship, and God wants genuine, sincere worship, and so you've got to solve that problem to make sure this doesn't have a problem. Go and fix it as much as you can, as much as you're responsible for. Go and address it, and then come back and offer your gift. Look, why is this an issue? Why am I harping on this? Because we live, I could be wrong, we live, I think, in a generation where people just move on from everything. Look, I, I don't think human nature has changed, but it just seems to me that people no longer resist the temptation to bail. People just move on. Hey, you don't like your spouse? Get yourself a new one. You don't like your job and the commitment that you've made? Doesn't matter, you can break the contract, get a good lawyer, just move on. You don't like your kids, they're not meeting your expectations, doing what you say, this isn't what you had in mind. Not a problem, get yourself a new family. You don't like your church? You don't like your pastor, don't say amen. <laughs> Seats aren't soft enough, air's not cool enough, pastor's hair's not long enough, whatever. Like whatever you know it is, just bam, 
You cut, hey, in the early church, there was one church in the city. Like, where do you go? You don't go anywhere. Now it's like, hey, I got all these options. It's not comfortable for, for me here. My felt needs aren't being met. I'll try another one on for size. Like, we're going shopping. Look, I'm saying to you, that is the spiritually immature way of dealing with things. All that proves, listen, I, I'm, I'm not attacking today. This goes for all of us. All that proves is that you are spiritually superficial. When your roots go deep, you do the hard work in relationships. You stick it out. You stick it out. The consequence of this was, the result was, that all people praise the Lord, man, and they fulfill their promises. I'm just saying to you, that's what we should be praying for. That's what we're aiming for, that we as the people of God would be united and that we would give God praise. So, so listen, Jesus does this in your life. Jesus sees you through to the end. In, in spite of our imperfections, in spite of our inadequacies, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our failures, you know, he doesn't just wash his hands, he doesn't just walk away, he doesn't get himself a new crew, he faithfully endures patiently with us and he sees us through to the end. Be confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, and so, and so if he does that, we should as well. Okay, this is what I say in difficult relationships. Forgiveness takes one person, reconciliation takes two people. I can forgive without someone coming and, and, and repenting and asking for forgiveness, I can do it because God does that supernaturally in my life. Reconciliation takes two parties coming together in agreement. Your responsibility is to do all that you can. You aren't responsible for how somebody else responds to your attempts of reconciliation, but you want to make sure that before God, you've done everything that you can. Jude 24, let me close with this, says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, amen. Father, we, we bless your name today. God, we're thankful to be sons, of, sons and daughters of the living God. We're thankful to be part of this miracle, the church. God, we confess that sometimes we're, we're too opinionated. Sometimes we focus on the wrong stuff. Um, sometimes our feathers get unnecessarily ruffled. Sometimes we react in the flesh, and God, we just want to grow. We want to be more mature. We want our roots to go deep. We don't want to be superficial Christians. God, we don't want to undermine or put your work at risk in anyone's life. We do not want to be the source of someone's stumbling in the church or on the outside. And so, God, we just bear our hearts to you. And we, we pray that you would help us bring the conviction, bring the cleansing, bring the strength, bring the wisdom, uh, give us the patience, Father, to seek you in all things that you might be glorified. Today, as our eyes are closed, and as we're in an attitude of prayer, maybe the relationship that's divided right now is your relationship with God. There's a brokenness, and you know it. The source of the brokenness, the Bible says, is our sin. Our sins have separated us from God. And you know what? No amount of morality, no religious works, no financial offering can solve that problem. It's a problem only God could solve, and God solved it. He solved it by sending his son to die on the cross in our place. He paid a penalty. He paid a penalty that we deserve to pay for our sins. 
and he rose again from the dead. Listen, God loves you. And God has wiped that divide away. All that's left for you to do is humbly come to him. Acknowledge your sin. All of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. And put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Depend upon him for salvation. Today, if this is you, God is reaching out to you today. And you know, you sense it. You can sense it right now that God is doing something. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you to bring you to this point where you take a step of faith yourself. You need God. And God is present and ready to help you. Today, if you would say, Pastor, that's me, I know. I know I need him today. I need his help. I need the forgiveness of my sins. I need burdens lifted. I need grace given. Today, if this is you, I want to pray for you. Would you raise your hand today? God's tugging on your heart. You need to take a step of faith and trust in Jesus Christ this morning right where you're sitting. Raise your hand. Let me see who you are. I want to pray that God would give you the strength as you take this step of faith. God bless you over here on my right and here in the center. Anybody else today right here in the center? Thank you for raising your hand. Over here on my left, thank you for raising your hand. God's ready and poised to help you today. You need freedom from addiction. God can help you today. You need relief from the fear of what happens after this life. God can help you today. He'll give you the gift of everlasting life. As you take this step of faith, anybody else, would you raise your hand this morning? Today, if you're a Christian, and uh, you know, in, in a way, your relationship with God is, is either going off the rails or it's off the rails. I want to encourage you today, God is not done with you. God loves you as far away as you may feel from God right now. He is as close as ever, and he's calling you home. He's calling you back to himself. Will you rededicate your life to Jesus? Will you let God give you a brand new beginning today? Christian, if this is you, would you raise your hand? I wanna, I wanna pray for you. Maybe relationship conflict has gotten the best, and you've, you've drifted from the Lord. If this is you this morning, raise your hand. Let me see who you are. God bless you. You're in the front, in the back, over here on my right. Awesome. God's good. Father, thank you. God, thank you for these precious souls that you love, that are made in your image, that, that the greatest price was paid for. We pray that you'd bless them now as they take this step of faith. Right where you guys are sitting this morning, I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer. Um, I've prayed for you, now you need to pray yourself. God wants a, a personal relationship with you, not through a pastor, but through his son, Jesus. And so, this morning I'm gonna lead you in a very simple prayer, a confession of sin and a declaration of faith. Right where you're sitting, follow me in this prayer. God, today, I give you my life and Father, I confess, I've sinned against you. I'm turning from my sin, and I'm turning to your Son. I believe he died for me, and that he rose again, and that you have broken the power of death, and you've begotten me again to a living hope. Today I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said. Hey, today if you followed me in prayer, welcome to the family of God. If you're putting your faith in Christ for the first time, glad if you're rededicating your life that God is giving this opportunity. Hey, right where you guys are sitting, if you did follow in prayer real quick, would you raise your hand? We just want to acknowledge you today. You can do this. Raise your hand up high. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You followed in prayer. Stretch. We're going to wait. We will wait here. Stretch your hand up high. Let me see who you are. Come on, you can do it. It's like this.
Come on. I, hey, six of you raise your hand. Are you kidding me? Come, come on now. You raise your hand. Let me see. Thank you. Awesome. Very good. Thank you.